Buy, scale, and selling secrets that you need to know. Hi, I'm Joe Kraus. I'm the host of the Buying Online Businesses podcast. And today, I'm speaking with John Cheng, who has bought two online businesses from Flipper and sold one, both being e-commerce businesses. And he knows a lot about scaling and exiting in e-commerce. In this pod, John and I talk about the business he bought, the first business he bought for Flipper, how much he bought it for, how he scaled it, and how he sold it, how much he sold it for as well, why he sold it, and everything he learned through the process of not just buying it, but growing it and then also selling it. And he shares his advice on each stage all the way through the podcast. Specifically, we talked about how he grew the business, his mindset around growth, his mindset about e-com, having product market fits, how to stay in the business, keep motivated to stay in the business. Uh, and then also the things he'd learned when it came time to sell the business, get the business ready for sale and how to make an exit very profitably. Now, there's so much value in this podcast episode. I know you absolutely going to love it. But before we dive in, we do talk about buying businesses. If you have not yet already got my Judelance framework, don't risk buying a business without it. It's free. You can get it at buyingonlinebusinesses.com for just free resources. It takes the guesswork out of buying businesses and thousands and thousands and thousands of people have got this framework. So use it. All right, let's dive in. Do you have a website you might want to sell either now or in the future? We have a hungry list of cashed up and trained up buyers that want to buy your content website. If you have a site making over $300 per month and want to sell it, head to buyingonlinebusinesses.co forward slash sell your business or email us at info at buyingonlinebusinesses.com because we will likely have a buyer. Details are in the description. John, thanks for your patience and, and welcome to the pod. Yeah, my pleasure. Happy to be here. Yeah, looking looking forward to having a chat about what you've been up to. Uh, so you bought a couple of businesses off Flipper. Congrats. And there's one particular one that you bought and scaled it and made an exit, which I really want to dig into. Why? Uh, so tell me, tell me about that business. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. This was probably 2017. So it was my first business I've ever bought. Um, I got pretty famous on Flipper for you know, buying it on Flippa, selling it on Flippa. I bought it for $7,500 and then two years later was able to sell it for a little over half a million dollars. So over a 50 X return and happy to share, you know, what I was thinking when I bought it, how I grew it, how, what I was thinking when I sold it, you know, and everything along the way and happy to just share what I learned uh, along that journey with your listeners and anything that can help them in, in their journey. Yeah, man. Cool. Cool. So $7,500, uh, and you bought an e-commerce business. Why, what made you want to buy an e-commerce business? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I didn't know what type of business I wanted to buy. I think the reason why I picked an e-commerce business was because every other business um, it didn't feel like you were getting really good value in terms of like the multiple or anything like that. I mean, even in e-commerce, you weren't really getting a great multiple, but the business was doing like a thousand dollars a month in revenue. And if, you know, for $7,500, you, you couldn't get any other business that was like doing as much revenue or profit or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Fair. And so, I often speak to people that look look at want to start, they're starting out like I want to buy a business. And sometimes if they're buying a business uh, and they don't have experience with digital marketing and the business is heavily reliant on digital marketing, I sort of like shy away from that. But you've done the opposite. You've went and bought a business that, like, did it have digital marketing before you bought it? Like, was it running paid ads at all before you bought it or not really? Not really, because it was doing like $1,000 a month in revenue. So that if you really think about that, yeah, it's like doing thirty dollars a day in sales, and you know, it was sometimes it was like you did a hundred, and sometimes you did zero, and they were selling to their friends and family, and all of that. I think one of the biggest lessons I learned, and this I think will be helpful for your listeners, is that I feel like when you buy a business, even especially when you buy one that's like relatively smaller, you're not buying a passive investment. You're not buying like a bond. You shouldn't really look at it like in terms of like the financials, the way I looked at it was like, I'm going to treat this as like a, like a real life NBA and I'm okay with losing all of this money. I 
probably will lose all of this money, but I will learn a lot, you know, through this process and being incentivized and motivated to learn about digital marketing, you know, by having this kind of like, you know, burn the bridges type thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if I hear you correctly. Um, you said, you know, it's not to, not to look at the financials or bother with the financials. I, I would uh, strongly suggest it's important to look at the financials and maybe also emphasize that if you're treating it like an education and you're wanting to scale it and grow at that, it's the financials might not absolutely be everything, but I still think the finance, like going through DD on financials is pretty important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I came from a hedge fund background, so um, I, I did a lot of like due diligence in the financials and that's pretty all I looked at. I think it's, yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying like, don't treat it as a, you know, don't look at the numbers or anything like that, but yeah. Yeah. I just, I just, the way I heard it, maybe it was only me. I just thought I better like make sure that I'm, I'm clear um, with DD because as you said, you've got experience in DD and it, it's pretty important, right? Like, tell me, did you learn, did you learn a lot through your experience doing DD? Like, and if so, what did you learn? Yeah. I mean, when I bought the business, I found out that like most of their sales were so not most, maybe like half of their sales were like friends and family. Um, you know, so like when you're buying a business that's small and it wasn't like they were trying to hide it or anything like that. It was basically like, Oh, we're starting this little brand. We're selling it to our friends. Our friends are trying to support us. Um, and then, you know, I bought it. It was doing a thousand dollars a month in revenue. A couple of months later, half the revenue went away because, you know, they were selling to like, like a local, like Missouri, um, just like a, a rec center in Missouri or like something like that. And, you know, they just didn't want to continue that relationship or like, some of the buyers had the same last name as the owner. And it was like, okay, well, I really just got to figure out. It was basically starting from scratch, but it was just like, I paid for a brand name and, you know, a Shopify fee. Yeah. That's a really good way to look at it because when you're buying something for seven and a half grand, uh, you like, there's a big difference between buying a website that's got some functionality and a, and a logo and a bit of a brand versus buying a business. What I classify as a business is a, a system that provides an income with little input. And it sounds like this was not an established business, uh, more so something starting out and then you built it into a proper business, which is awesome. So when you first bought it, what were your, what were your steps on how, and how did you build out your growth plan for this? Yeah, I mean, when I first started out, I tried a lot of different things. I tried you know, influencer marketing, I tried Google ads, you know, I bought books on, you know, SEO and like all this stuff and eventually settled on kind of focus that, you know, Facebook was going to be the platform. And I just kind of thought of it as like, oh, like other people are able to make Facebook work. Facebook is a real company. It's not like a scam, you know, like they're one of the biggest companies ever so i was like there's something that i don't know and eventually you know through a lot of pain and wait like spending my own money uh figured out you know creative and facebook ads and all of that so and find and like product market fit find merchandising you know finding products that actually sell to a very specific customer base and all of that you know yeah so um uh, I got a side tangent story. Facebook is very much a real business. In fact, I saw Mark Zuckerberg just a few weeks ago. I was in Japan snowboarding with some friends. We went into a just a random bar. Um, it's wild. I got some footage of me standing in line with with Zucks, like literally just behind me. Um, and yeah, he was just sitting there eating lunch by himself. There's a bodyguard in the bar on the other other side of the bar and all that sort of stuff. And um, pretty like. I think a lot of people in the bar were like really like blown away. <laughs> um, and I thought it was a pretty interesting story. And I really enjoyed looking at other people's reactions when they realized it was like Mark Zuckerberg. Like there wasn't a lot of attention around him, but like there was like, you know, people were talking in the pub and stuff. And um, it's quite an interesting, interesting thing that that happened when I was in Japan a few weeks ago. 
But aside from that side note tangent on Zucks and and running into him, uh, you you went with Facebook and why? And so you decided on Facebook because of that's where most of your audience was, or it was did you, did you decide based on figures on how much your ROI you're getting from that particular platform compared to others? Like what made you stay with it? Yeah, I mean, I tried every other platform platform and i think i bought a book on google ads and uh, I, w- I tried reading it and it just didn't make a lot of sense to me like i tried running some of the ads and and in the back of this book it was a it was a guy named like perry marshall who was like this big google ads person back in the day and then he had a um like it was some like referral thing where he referred me to this like facebook ads book and uh, then I joined that and then they had some like group attached with it. And um, actually like uh, a couple of people that you might know were involved there, like Molly Pittman, James Shramko was like big in there in, in that space or they kind of knew each, each other. So I ended up joining this like group with, you know, this early agency founder, Molly Pittman, and they were just like talking about like how to run ads and, and I learned that way. Yeah, cool. Yeah, James, James, I was actually just talking to um talking about James Shrepko the other other week. One of my friends is catching up with him in a week's time. Um, but yeah, closely connected with Ezra Firestone, who was probably in that book. Um, Molly Pittman. Yeah, so some some uh people spending some serious coin, you know, millions of dollars on ads a year, um, maybe even month per month. But all right, cool. So then you started with your Facebook journey and is that was like the main way that you scaled the scaled the business. And how did you and, and how did you decide like what product was like the number one to put ads into? Yeah, it was I mean it was really difficult because I couldn't with the products that, that we had none of them were able to be profitable on ads. You know, it was just a way lower average order value. It was kind of like it was it wasn't drop ship, but it was like very low quality stuff, low priced stuff. So we did a lot of testing and I would say we tested like maybe hundreds of different styles, um, designs of jewelry, cat jewelry, dog jewelry, you know, these stones, that stones. And eventually we, we came across um, one style of jewelry that just immediately kind of like overnight was like like a huge hit and the business went from maybe like ten thousand dollars a month in revenue at that time to like fifty thousand a month over like overnight like it was basically like a rocket ship once you had this kind of design of jewelry that really worked with you know some facebook audience and it was kind of like the early um uh, times of like the majority style like fine jewelry for every day, um, gold plated, uh, sterling silver, minimalist, uh, jewelry style. And, um, yeah, we like luckily like jumped onto that wave and was able to grow it through that. And, you know, 50 became a hundred, a hundred, uh, became 200 and eventually like grew to seven figures and got to a point where it was doing a healthy amount of revenue per month. Cool. Yeah. Congrats. It's so important to understand that the product, like having the right product in front of the right market, it sells like hotcakes uh, if you work that out. And I guess people don't understand that, you know, when you're starting a business, what you're really doing is iterations to find product market fit until you get something that works and then it can be scalable. Um, Because a lot of people try to get to that level they can scale uh, and spend a lot of money and then burn out and never get to it. Uh, but it's good that you made it. So congrats. And what were some of the key lessons that you learned, I guess, through and, or how long did you have this before you sold it? And what were some of the key lessons you learned that you would love to share around like growing a business, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that I had it for like a little over two years and I would say similar to your point, like growth is not linear. Like it, it's, it would be nice to think of business as, oh, you do X and you get Y and it's kind of like a formula, but it's not really like that. Um, Like you said, in the beginning, it's a lot of pain, a lot of testing, a lot of losing money. And it feels like you're kind of like digging for gold. And the hardest part I think is 
um, believing that the next product that you test or the next design or the next headline or the next marketing message is that correct one. Because imagine you do something 20 times in a row and they've all failed. Like it takes a certain mindset to be like, all right, 21, that's, this is going to be it. And still be excited about that because, and especially if you've never gone through that, you know, journey before it, it could be really frustrating to be like, well, I tried everything. Like this just doesn't work. Or like, it's not my fault. Like online business just doesn't work or something like that. So I, my mindset was, you know, kind of like an Edison, just like testing things in the lab and just trying not to lose too much money while like, you know, every day the ads were like not profitable or this design didn't work or this design worked a little bit, but then, oh, it didn't work. So I think when you find product market fit, you'll know it's product market fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You'll know it. And that's a really good example. Uh, another one is like Walt Disney. Um, the amount of rejections and there's authors and, you know, movie stars that talk about this as well. Like the amount of rejection that he went through with Mickey Mouse to get to finally produce it uh, was a high amount. It was insane. And now it's one of the largest empires in the world, Disney. So uh, stick with it guys. Yeah. I like that mindset. And so, what made you decide to start? What what caused you to think, all right, I want to sell this now? And then how did you go about getting the business sellable? Yeah, so I would say this. Um, I was running it for a period of like a year and a half. And I basically like, it was my entire life. I didn't have friends. I didn't go out. I didn't like go on dates. It was like, I, I woke up, I checked the sales. Like I did stuff. And then I went to sleep, I checked the sales. And I basically like got to a point where I felt a little burnt out. And um, I think burnout happens usually when things are kind of like not working well. Cause if it was growing super fast, um, as you know, like I grew it from a thousand dollars a month in revenue to like, you know, some months we were doing like $200,000 a month in revenue. So when you grow that fast, you feel like it just feels so good right you're like oh i'm like i i gotta i gotta do all these things but it, it feels good because we're growing it feels like you're getting pulled along and you know the business was still relatively healthy maybe like 100 or 120 a month in revenue but um when you're not like when you used to that hyper growth then like kind of like you know five percent ten percent growth doesn't feel that good anymore um, and then also, you know, Facebook ads is, is relatively like unstable, you know, it's not just, even back then it was relatively unstable. So there are some days where like my life like flashed before my eyes. Like I had like 90% of my net worth in this business. I was like 27 years old, you know, I, when I first started, like I, I was like trying to get food stamps cause I didn't have enough cash. So it was like, yeah, it was like I, my life flashed before my eyes and I was like, you know what? I'd like to take like some chips off the table. Um, and then the selling process is, is pretty stressful. I would say from the moment you decide to sell to the moment you get the cash in your account, it's probably like another like four to six months. So the whole process and all that while you have to like talk to people who are interested and still run the business and, you know, almost get to the finish line but then they're like oh i can't get a loan or whatever it is or whatever you know issues that come can come up yeah yeah man congrats on on sticking with it for as long as you did with like the amount of hours you put into it um i'm sure that you learned that that might not have been the healthiest approach um for scalability of a business and yourself <laughs> but it's a really good life lesson right like i've done that myself too where i worked so hard i got glandular fever super sick i didn't even know until i found out and you know a year later and had to go through this wild protocol to get my health back on track um and the sale like i'm really interested in the sale so did you so you decided to sell take some chips off the table i think that's such a wise move congrats on that like that sets you up for the next few projects and the next part of your journey uh what did you do in terms of setting the site or the business up for sale was there much or was it already pretty ready to just hand over like tell me a little bit about that yeah i mean there were like sops and everything like that and 
um, you know, an e-commerce business is relatively easy to understand. It's like there's customer service, there's fulfillment, there's, you know, the marketing and like those three things are probably like the core of the business and that makes up 90% of the business. So, um, yeah, I mean, I try to run the business from the perspective of a long-term owner. So I would always try to do things that were, you know, kind of like best for the customer because I didn't really expect to sell it. And, you know, it just got to a point where I was like, man, this is like really stressful and all of that. But it wasn't like I was planning on selling it. It wasn't like I was like pumping it and then like hoping someone would, you know, take me out. And uh, yeah, so yeah, like happy to answer, you know, yeah, any questions that this, yeah, like the seller might have had or like, yeah, well, what did you have about the sale process? Yeah, well, firstly, I think that's the best mindset for somebody that is growing a business is to not have in mind that you're going to sell it because then you can cut corners, um, which is, yeah. Firstly, before we dig into that, did you, is this a sell product distribution business? Like you were fulfilling the products yourself, like you were buying wholesale and then, and then, and then selling, sending them out yourself, or was it partly drop shipping? Like how, how was the model? Yeah. When we first started, it was drop shipping. And then we got to the point where we found a proper supplier to actually make the product. And I mean, they were still based in China and, but you know, we had a contact with them. They would make our branded boxes and everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I mean, jewelry is very like high margin anyway. So it's not like, you know, we needed a lot of space and everything like that. And even back then there was like some program called like e-packet where it was cheaper to ship from China to the U S than the U S to the U S. So, you know, and customers most of the time got their order within like a week or so. So, you know, we had, um, an arm in China that basically they would ship from China to the U S we would hold some inventory in the U S as well and ship to customers. Like shipping was relatively cheap. Like this was like under a pound, under half a pound, like just, you know, jewelry. Um, so that was the good thing about it. So yeah, it was mostly, I'd say it's like a hybrid model, but it wasn't like drop ship in that we didn't, you know, know our suppliers or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah, my, my question around like getting it ready for sale was did you have to get your like PL and finances sorted? Like, did you have to have your SOPs all built out? It sounded like you already had all that pretty, pretty well ironed out and ready for sale. So did you is is that right? So in terms of like the finances, yeah, like we kept basically good financials throughout the life of the business. And I mean that helped um it helped that when i sold the business the buyer got a really good price like i sold it for probably less than it was worth but for me it was the right decision because i was like you know i just don't want to do this anymore at the time so you know they got a really good price so they weren't like you know looking at every little you know granny expense or something like that yeah cool and so you said it was like maybe a four month, four, four to six month process to sell it. So did you list it on Flippa? Yeah. Yeah. We listed on Flippa. We actually got pretty far with one buyer and then last moment he couldn't get the loan. And then we talked to kind of like our second choice and was able to finalize a deal with him. Cool. Cool. And was it cash or was it a little bit of an earn out? So it was a mix. It was a mix of cash and a seller note. So I would say it's like seventy five percent cash and maybe like twenty, yeah, twenty five percent like not earn out because it was owed no matter what, but it was a seller note. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool, awesome, man. So what what did you learn? Like for people that are building a business now, they've just bought one, they're building it out. What you know? What advice would you give to somebody? wanting to sell their business and go through that process of an exit? Yeah, I would say um, the thing that really helped me when I was selling the business is telling my, you know, cause you would get pretty far along on the path with someone and then they just kind of pull out or they're not that interested. And um, I just kept telling myself like, whether or not this business sells, the value is there, you know, like 
you can't deny that this business that was doing a thousand dollars a month in revenue, um, that was now at the time doing like 120, 150 a month in revenue, uh, was not more valuable than it was before. Right. So, you know, I would just tell myself that I would say if you're looking to sell a business and you're, you're currently growing a business, like people don't fall for, you know, tricks or anything like that. There are things that make your business more valuable and like, you know, like you either kind of like, if, if no one is wanting to buy your business, it's probably because like, there are things about that business that are not attractive. You know what I mean? Like, like you want something that you can transfer over, like every business buyer wants the same thing. They want reliability of revenues. They want recurring revenues. They want growth. They want high margin. They want low, you know, they, they want like something that's not attached to the owner or like not brand name, you know, like jaredkraus.com. Like these are things that everybody you would want as a buyer, right? So just think of like, how do you make it attractive to a buyer? Yeah, I love that. And so that's what you did in your, obviously your listing. Um, and what about uh, your workload for this? Did you, you know, how many hours a week were you working when you were selling it? Uh, when I was selling it, I mean, I was still working like 20, 30 hours a week on it. And the same process could take like, I don't know, five, 10 hours a week. It depends on like how many people were interested and how many people I had to talk to. Yeah. And what about the training, training period? Did you have a long training period for the seller? Uh, no, it was probably like three months and the, he would hit me up with, you know, questions after, but you know, that was fine. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And so where did you, how did you reinvest the money? <laughs> so I actually bought a couple other e-commerce businesses and have now grown them to kind of similar revenue run rates and hopefully will continue to grow them. But I bought a couple of apparel businesses and, you know, I thought I was going to be done and ride off into the sunset, but I was like, this is really not enough money to ride off anywhere. So I was like, I think now that I, um, you know, had a little safety cushion and didn't have to operate from fear every time you had like a bad day on the ads or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And what's your plan with these next e-commerce businesses? Are you just building to hold, uh, building to sell or what's the go? Yeah. So, yeah, like I said, like, I feel like the mistake I made with my first business was selling when like forcing to sell because I was stressed. I think, you know, building the value in the businesses is the most important part, whether or not you capture it via just holding on or selling it. I think that's relatively not easy, but I would say it, it's like, it's not a, you don't have to put much effort into it. It's kind of like harvesting like the, the seeds that you've been kind of growing this whole time. Right. So, so I, I haven't decided yet. I'm probably going to continue to grow them until it stops being fun to, to do business and, this, this time just be a little bit more experienced. Oh man, that's really cool. And so I know that for myself, I've learned so many things through the different businesses I've had. You know, I've had media businesses, I've bought e-commerce businesses, scaled them, sold them as well, um, spent a bunch of money on ads and and then went different route like information and, um, you know, selling, selling info, info products sort of thing, membership and all that sort of stuff. Now, what did you learn from the same business model from going from, you know, buying your first e-com to buying multiple e-com businesses that allowed you to make it funner to run the business, uh, these businesses that you have and stay in the business longer? Or even like, what did you learn that was better for growth? Yeah, I would say that in e-commerce, like what you sell really matters, you know? Um, it's not really about like your charisma or your ability. It is to some extent, but certain businesses just do better than others by nature of the product. And um, that a lot of times it's not like skill or anything like that, that, that it's kind of just like the DNA of the, of the product that you're selling. So like businesses with a subscription component generally are better Businesses that are higher margin are usually better than, you know, businesses with higher average order values are better and, you know, all types of like little things like that. Um, I would say 
what I learned the most about an e-commerce business is um, what you're really selling is not a physical product. What you're really selling is a solution to some sort of hyper specific problem, right? Like with our jewelry business, we, we called our customers and we we're like, Hey, like, what do you like about this? Right. And they, they were like, Oh, like, it looks so expensive, but it's not. And we were selling this for like, we would sell like a ring for like $60 and they didn't know that we got it made for like $5. And they were like, Oh, but it, it looks like this style that looked like $400. So like to them, they were getting a good deal. We were getting a good deal and like everyone was, was happy. Right. So I feel like a lot of times, especially in e-commerce, people kind of like try to think about like, how do I trick this into people or how do I force people into this? Like you want a business so good that your customer knows your margins and is still happy to pay it. You know, like um, I, I use this brand uh, Monos. So like they make like luggage, right. And you know, they probably have really good margins. It's like $200 for a suitcase, but they're so well designed. It looks really sleek. Like it's a great experience. Like I need, and I need a, a piece of luggage. Right. And I'm like, okay, the, like, I'm not going to go make luggage. Like I'm not going to, you know, source my supplier for luggage and do it like that. Like I'm, I'll give them like an extra hundred dollars for, for kind of like going through that whole process and having a brand and doing that. Right. So, um, and I, I would feel like my customers are hopefully saying the same thing. I love that. I've found that the best way to grow a business is not what we typically, what we think that the customers want. It's actually just getting feedback from them and giving them more of what they want, less of what they don't want. And that's exactly what you've done, like with speaking to them on the phone, getting great customer feedback. I mean, you can go then and and they say, oh, we like the pieces of jewelry that, you know, they look very expensive. They look like a $400 piece, but I'm getting it for $60. Then that's an idea straight away. Oh, how do I get these? you know, go look at all these expensive pieces and how do I recreate those, but make them a bit cheaper and make them look similar, if not better, but cheaper. And you can sell far more products like hotcakes. So it's a really good piece of advice. Exactly. It's, it's like that kind of like job to be done that, and do, do you know the story of the jobs to be done with the milkshakes and whatnot or no? Cool. So, uh, I mean, this is my favorite story about kind of business and it colors like how I think about, you know, like if you have a business, it's basically a job to be done. So there's this Harvard professor, he was hired by McDonald's and McDonald's asked him, you know, like we need your help selling milkshakes. Right. And, you know, we tried everything. We, we tried saying like more milkshake, uh, more, like more chocolatey, like more chocolate chunks or like stronger, or like bigger or like more value for a dollar. And he's like, none of that worked. And he what he did was he he kind of like watched how people you know use the milkshake or how they like why they did it and he noticed that most of the milkshakes or a, like a large amount of the milkshakes were being sold early on in the morning and before like 9 a.m so he goes up to these cars buying these milkshakes through the drive through and he asked them hey uh you know like what, what are you trying to do with these milkshakes it's pretty early like is there any trying to job that you're trying to do with these milkshakes like and and why didn't other things like kind of work and the people said oh yeah like i like a milkshake for breakfast because you know i can't eat a banana because you know like then i, I can't i can't like open my hands and what do i do with the peel i can't eat a candy bar because it doesn't like fill me up as much you know i can't eat like you know a sandwich or anything because my hands get greasy but the milkshake is like this perfect thing that keeps me full enough until lunchtime where, you know, I don't get hungry again and my hands aren't dirty or anything like that. So, you know, that was like the insight that really powered a lot of the growth. So, you know, we try to do kind of like this a very similar thing where I'll give you an example, like one of our other apparel businesses that we bought uh, serves primarily like plus size women. Right. And when I purchased it, I, I thought like plus size clothing is plus size clothing. I just went to different places and bought plus size clothing, marked them up and thought, okay, plus size women get plus size clothing that like, come, come get it. Like my revenue is going to go up. Right. And it wasn't until like, it wasn't until like I called a lot of the customers and I noticed that they were all not all, but a majority of them 
were wearing these outfits to go to events, to like go to parties, to dress up. So that would explain why like the plus size clothing that was more plain or kind of like floral dresses didn't really work as well as kind of like the like shiny prints or like the, you know, very kind of uh, like showstopper, like get compliments, like, oh, that's like a cool like suit that you're wearing, right? So knowing that like job to be done, we're able to merchandise a lot better because, you know, we're, we're not buying plain t-shirts. We're not buying jeans. We're buying like, hey, dress up for your next party. Like we're, you know, doing like, oh, this is our version of a luxury designer, you know, but in plus size for you. So it's kind of like, that was a big lesson learned from the jobs to be done kind of theory. I love that story, man. Like understanding what job is somebody trying to do and help them fulfill that job with your product. Uh, and you can, you can make it very subjective versus like, you know, yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. John, thanks so much for coming on. It's really, really been fun to yeah, talk. Sure. Really appreciate it. Yeah. My pleasure, man. Yeah. Um, all right, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I'll speak to you all soon. If you want to check out more about John, I'll link to his stuff and, uh, yeah, thanks again. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks, Jared. Thank you. Hey, YouTube watcher. If you thought that video was good, you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy, or check out my playlist on how I made my first hundred K from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out. It's an awesome playlist. You'll enjoy it.